Welcome back to the Chinese Lantern Project Box. Today we'll be working on the embroidered mandala. And you know, even if you're not making the box itself, you can follow along and make this a beautiful little wall hanging, a page in your textile journal that we'll be working on later, or even a quilt block. Here I'm using my jumbo popsicle stick of threads and yarns and a piece of wool suiting. It's thinner than wool felt and it's just a wonderful fabric to stitch into. But any solid cotton or tightly woven embroidery fabric will do. Just make sure you can't see the batting behind it. I generally put a piece of batting into the hoop behind the fabric because for me it's just more enjoyable to stitch into with that extra padding. It just feels good. The finished square is five and a half inches so I've taken a square ruler of that size and a chalk pencil just to mark the border and then um, I took a couple of strands of DMC and I worked a basting stitch to outline because I know the chalk will rub off really quickly. Then I marked the center. I drew and basted eight stitch lines from the top to the bottom, from side to side, and on each of the diagonals. And then now I've got my, my guidelines. I thought it would be fun to have a perfect circle, nice option to maybe fill the center in later because I, I don't know what I want to do in the center yet. So I just stitched on a one inch button that I may or may not keep and at that point I hadn't decided but it's just nice to have the option. And so now we're going to stitch using our guidelines to work the design. So let's start with some focal beads, just something really simple. I'm going to stitch these beads on the northeast southwest lines. They're sparkly beads and they measure just under a quarter of an inch. I'm using a double strand of thread that is similar color to the background so that the thread will be hidden and the beads can really stand out. You're just going to come up right next to the button from behind, place your bead and then push the thread back down on the line through the fabric leaving enough space so the bead will lie flat. In other words, don't put your needle right next to the stitch coming out. You want to leave that little quarter inch gap. Go through each at least twice so it's more secure because these beads are pretty heavy. We don't want them flopping around. We want them really tight and secure so that we can move forward and stitch from there. Don't worry about stitching through the basting threads. Just try to ignore them. They're definitely useful and you're going to need them. We can clip them out as we go or just wait until the end of the square. You know, just a little sharp scissor will, you can make a few clips and then pull them out. Um, now, I'm not looking at anything to make this design. I'm just playing. I'm adding things as I go. I don't really have a master plan. I'm just using my materials to make stitches and, and bead patterns. So as you stitch, ideas will pop into your head. And of course, you can follow along with me. But if you have a different idea for your piece, you know, maybe some different beads or a different stitch motif, I always want to encourage you to play with that. No matter what, your piece will turn out beautiful because the human eye just loves radial symmetry, which is a design that is spiraling out or coming out from the center. Um, it's a very pleasing thing to do. If you are loving the colors that you have, it, it will turn out. Just keep playing with it and enjoy it. Don't stress. On the diagonal lines, I decided to do something different. As you can see, I've placed three white size six seed beads in a line from the button. So using the same thread, exit out of the fabric on one of the diagonal lines, place three beads. Use your needle to push down on the beads and lay them on the fabric so you can determine where you'll be pushing the needle back down through. Go through all of them again. And then to keep them in a straight line, a little trick is to come up between two beads right next to the thread and then push the needle down on the other side of the thread to lock that um, thread line in place. This little trick allows you to be able to place a large line of beads, whether they're straight, swirly, curvy, and keep them perfectly in place. It's not super crucial with these three, but when doing those long lines on a fabric, um, it's definitely essential. Okay, so going back to the northeast southwest lines, I wanted to bring in some of that yummy copper color. I'm working this in the alchemy colorway, so I'm focusing on like whites, blacks, silvers, golds, copper. Um, I just thought that would be kind of a cool look, so trying it out. 
to get the shapes relatively the same size and shape and placement, I just drew and cut out a little one inch leaf on a piece of postcard material. I marked the right side with an R just so that the same side is facing up every time. Placed on top of the focal bead and measured down from the top. Just make sure it's close to the same measurement on all sides. Then take a chalk pencil and draw a line around the stencil. Here, this chalk pencil is a brand called Soline. I could not live without this. It's mechanical, so you just push the chalk down as you need it. It's super great. With two strands of DMC floss, work the fishbone stitch. So this provides a really pretty satin stitch look on either side of the vein, the center of the leaf. What you'll do is you'll come up just under a quarter of an inch from the very tip of the leaf, then push the needle back down right at the tip. Now before you push it all the way through, just take your ruler and measure it again before you pull it all through, just to make sure that the needle is just where you want it. And it doesn't really matter what the, your measurement's gonna be different than mine because it depends on the leaf that you drew, but as long as your measurement is the same distance away and your leaf is about a one inch piece, you'll be fine. Just make sure your measurements match your measurements. Okay, and then come up right alongside of that stitch on the chalk line, but you'll see it's just below the tip of the leaf and it will create an angle from the top. So once you pull that through, push the needle down just below the center stitch in the center. Then repeat that on the other side where you're gonna come up right along the side on the chalk line and then come back down just below the tip and it kind of looks like it's sort of braiding a little bit on the bottom. Then you're just gonna, you're gonna just repeat this motion, alternating sides and following the chalk line and coming back down in through the center. Keep the stitches really close so it produces a solid stitched leaf. When you're finished with all of the stitches, you can go ahead and knot it and weave it through the batting on the back. I've got a sparkly black and copper ribbon yarn that I think will outline the motifs really well. So I'm gonna work some couching here. I'm using two strands of black DMC floss for the couching thread, because I want this to be relatively hidden. Although there are lots of times where I'll use a thicker contrasting thread so the couching material will show. So if you wanna do that, try it, it'll look great. But it all depends on the look that you want. You can place the end of your outlining yarn at your starting point and whip stitch around it, or if your yarn is thin enough, like mine is here, pop it through the fabric and then tie a knot at the back. Either way, you're gonna to wanna to stitch it into place at that starting point. Here I'm starting just under into one side of a focal bead near the button. Hold the yarn straight up above the diagonal triple bead so that there's a line that extends about a quarter of an inch above and that they all measure the same from the diagonal corner. Now, if you've done something a little different, that's totally okay. Just make decisions based on what you've done before. Just the most important thing is just to keep checking the measurements on all sides so that you can be sure that your embroidered mandala will be imperfectly perfect. It's always a good idea to check the measurements when your needle is poked through just to make sure that nothing has shifted. Hold the yarn in place and then make a stitch with the couching thread to hold it and, and be, so you'll be able to start your angle there. I generally work one stitch around the yarn and then another stitch, maybe I'll pierce a couple fibers of that to really hold it in place, um, but pull it first before you actually go through the fibers just to make sure that it's exactly where you want it because you won't be able to pull through the couching stitches then. Then come back down on the line that you just made with your couching thread and make two more holding stitches or couching stitches around the yarn in the center. Pull the yarn taut 
go back through the fabric on the other side under the next focal bead or if you're using a heavy yarn you can just cut it extending a little bit beyond that point stitch around it at the end and then just clip it just to get the little phrase off um, but then once you've got that in place you're going to want to make a few more securing stitches in the center of that line And then of course you can always come back to the very top and shape the point if you want to put more stitches in through the fibers you can make it into a, a sharper point which is what i did here you'll use the same method to outline the fishbone leaf that you've made so you're going to start at the base of the leaf stitch it and then just work your way around the leaf with the couching thread every quarter of an inch so that it's completely outlined and that outline will stay in place. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take the focal yarn, the decorative yarn, the outlining piece, and poke it through the end point so I don't have all that yarn laying on the top of the piece as I'm working. Um, you can leave a loose loop and just work your way around, tightening from the back as you stitch. And then again, um, make sure that you don't take any pieces of the decorative thread unless you're positive that your outline is exactly where you want it because you can see I'm pulling sometimes just to tighten the outline thread after a few couching stitches once you're really happy with the placement of it then you can go through and just pierce a couple of fibers and then and then it'll really hold I've introduced a bit of gold and a little bit more copper on the diagonal line. So breaking up my trusty ruler, I marked a mark where I wanted this motif to end from the point above the white beads. I'm going to work a long lazy daisy. So you're going to come up just under the point with your thread of choice. And here I'm using a sparkly gold embroidery thread. Then go back down right next to it. Hold the loop in place with the top of it touching the marked line. Make sure the needle catches the loop when you insert that needle into the, that little space where, the, where you've made that mark. And place a size 6 and a size 8 seed bead on the needle. Push the beads down so that they're tight against the fabric. And then pop the needle back down into the fabric right over the top of the beads. Work a fly stitch by coming up on the side of the loop about halfway down, then go back down directly across on the other side of the loop. Before pulling the loop all the way through, bring the needle back up at the starting point of that initial lazy daisy under the point there, and then catch the loop. Gently pull down the thread, and it'll tighten the loop and put the base of the loop right where your stitch is coming out of, and then just push the needle and the thread back down through the fabric at the very top of the bead trio. Knot it off and weave it in the back. Then for a different texture but of the same color, I wanted to add some gold bugle beads, but of course use contrasting beads here, whatever it is that you have and want to use. Uh, bugle beads are just elongated glass bead. They come in all different lengths and colors, but they all have very small holes. So you're gonna use a regular small sewing thread and a double strand of thread that matches the background. I've worked these bugle beads into the base of the Lazy Daisy space and then on the spaces on the sides of the fly stitch that we made previously. So on either side, so there'll be one in the middle and then two on each side. And I only went through the bead once as they're relatively light and I know they'll stay in place with just that double strand of thread. I want to add a bit more texture to the middle by adding a few beads and a chain stitch border around the fishbone leaves. Starting with a size 8 pearl cotton in a similar color to the background, exit the needle at the base of the leaf and make tiny lazy daisy stitches along the couched yarn border. When you combine the stitches, it's called a chain stitch. Try your best to keep the stitches even, but don't get locked down in going for perfection. I'm focusing on one eighth of an inch stitches for this one and then of course make sure your needle is over the thread before you pull it through to lock the loops in place. When starting a new stitch 
Insert the needle right next to or even in the same hole as the thread that's exiting out of the fabric and then just continue along, locking your loops in place. To end the line of chain stitch, insert the needle into the fabric at the top just over the last loop. I wanted the stitches to face the same way, so rather than continuing on, I started on the other side of the leaf at the base and worked up to the other side. On either side of the size 6 bead trio, place a size 8 seed bead with your sewing thread. I'm going along the edge of the button, stitching into each of them from left to right. This will ensure the beads will face the same way and look the same. Then on the top of those, exit the needle above the size 8 bead and place 3 size 12 beads on the needle and fill the rest of the angled space by pushing the needle between the second and the third size 6 bead in the trio. The string will sort of hug the second bead and, and you'll see it as a, a little bit of an arc. On top of the bead trio, place a size 6 bead on either side of the fly stitch stem. This one you can work through twice just to make sure it stays in place. Then at the top of the fishbone leaf, place a size 6 bead and then a size 12 bead. Push them down to the fabric, skip the size 12 bead and insert the needle into the bigger bead to hold it down. And you can stitch this through twice to, to secure it down. I've decided to cut away the button to see how my little center circle looks. Um, so I clipped the button away, I clipped all the threads and tore them all out. I really like the negative space that that circle provides, so I may just leave it as is. But who can say at this point? Now it's time to stretch the design out a little bit with some more beads and embroidery. Mm -hmm. I'm using a size 8 pearl cotton, and on one side of the basting line extending out to the diagonal and starting at the top of that size 8 bead, you're going to make a running stitch. So you just make a small 1 8 of an inch stitch and then exit the needle about an eighth of an inch away and above that stitch. Then push the needle back into the same hole as the top of the previous stitch and work along that side of the basting line. So you're just going to, you know, from that second stitch come up, eighth of an inch away and above, then back down through the hole of the previous stitch, the top hole of the previous stitch. If the basting threads are driving you nuts, go ahead and clip a few stitches, but leave the line going up to the diagonal so that you can still use that as a guide. Break out your trusty ruler and measure half inch. Start another running stitch on the other side of the now imaginary line. Place the space wide enough so that you can place these tiny little 12 seed beads in the center of the two stitch lines. So once you have your two stitch lines done, measure up a quarter of an inch above those lines and right in the center of them, work a lazy daisy. Watch your measurements. Then make two more lazy daisies on each side so you have a five petal base. The bases of these petals are placed right next to the previous one and not coming out of the same hole. So you can move them over a little bit and then just work straight out so that the outer petals almost lay horizontal, perpendicular to the line.
Then when you're done with that, knot it off and weave it into the batting. Then with sewing thread and a tiny needle, come up through the center of the running stitch that you made and add three size 12 beads. This is another way to work a string of beads and keep them strong and, and just where you want them. Push the beads down and then insert the needle into the fabric at the top. Push the needle up between the first and the second bead and then pass the thread through the last two beads. Add two more, push them down and stitch them. And then just come up between those last two that you placed and the previous one, pass it to the, through those two, and then keep going until you have seven and have reached the top of the stitch lines. And then come up in the same hole at the top of one of the running stitch lines, and we're gonna add a different color of size 12 beads up to the outer petal using the same method. We'll just start with two this time because we're gonna arc it up just slightly. by the time you're done with that you'll have six size 12 seed beads on each side so it provides sort of a cup where those petals are sitting then in the center place a size six bead and go through that twice to secure it down and you can see that i'm working the stitch side to side but honestly you can work the stitch however you want whether you want to stitch the bead from top to bottom or side to side doesn't matter the key is to be consistent with all of the beads that you use in their respective spots. To elongate the petals, I'm using a velour yarn to make small stab stitches coming in from the tops of the petals and then working longer stitches in between each one. You'll have nine stab stitches in total when you're done and they're really easy. You're just coming up and then going back down. That's why they call it a stab stitch. It's the simplest stitch, but it's got so many great uses. And then when you're done with those nine, with the same yarn, we're gonna bring that color back down lower onto the stem. So we're just gonna work a simple fly stitch. Exit out on either side of the running stitch and bead stem about a quarter of an inch away. Insert the needle directly across from that on the other side. Come up just above the center bugle bead, catch the loop, and insert the needle into the fabric, catching the loop knot it and tie it off in the back then with a size 8 pearl cotton of a different color make a stab stitch inside each petal and a french knot at the end of each velour stab stitch And then to work a French knot, you're going to come up at the top of one of the stitches, hold the yarn tight with your other hand, 
and wrap the needle four times. Swing the yarn under the needle and insert the needle into the fabric just alongside the exit point. Hold everything in place and slowly pull the thread until your knot forms. Repeat that for each stitch. And as you can see, you know, all of these stitches that we're making are really simple and very basic, but it's the way that you combine and build on them that makes a piece look more complicated and makes your piece look really beautiful. Now let's fill in some of the negative space with a bit more texture. I have two strands of black DMC floss here and coming up at the base of a fishbone leaf, work a stem stitch an eighth of an inch away from the chain stitch and follow the curve of the leaf. To start, insert the needle a quarter of an inch away from the exit point and scoop a little stitch exiting halfway in between the two. Remember to keep the thread on the same side with every stitch in a stem stitch. In this case, I'm working, I'm keeping the thread above the work. From here on, take 1 8 inch stitches and exit out of the top of the last stitch. It's a gentle curve, so don't take any stitches larger than an eighth of an inch. When you get towards the top of the leaf, begin to flare it out away from the leaf just a little bit. Finish the stem by pushing the needle down into the fabric at the top. Work a small fly stitch at the top. And we're going to do a triple fly stitch here. So once your first fly stitch is done, you'll work the second fly stitch just on the outside of those two stitches. The sides will extend just a little bit above um, the inside one. And then you're going to work another smaller one on the outside of the second fly stitch with the sides just a bit shorter just to add some interest. Work a shorter stem with a triple fly just outside this one. Start at the same place, so it kind of looks like they're both coming out of the same place under the leaf. Follow the curves, but don't touch them um, once you get away from that beginning point because the negative space behind these motifs will really make them pop out. As you work, watch the shapes and sizes of the previous ones and match them up as close as possible. Don't go for perfection here. I didn't even measure right here. I just eyed it up and tried to get as close as I could. Imperfect things are way more interesting if you ask me. Let's add some beads and a little textured pop.
puff at the top of these fly stitches. Looking at my threads, I really like the look of this gray sparkly one and I think it'll fray really well. So I cut a one inch piece, I laid it across the top, and then I came out of the top of the fly stitch in the center there with my needle, held the yarn right up to the needle and then made a stitch just to hold the yarn in place. Then I made another stitch, this time going through the fibers to secure it down. Then exit the needle in the very bottom of the center fly stitch and place two size 8 seed beads on the needle. Fill the fly stitch space by inserting the needle back through the yarn piece. Secure the beads by stitching over the thread in the center of those beads. Pull apart the fibers of the yarn to make them fringe. Then give it a little haircut to shape it across the top. And you can see that these little vines create uh, an image of a square shape within the design, which was not my intention at all. It was just kind of a little happy accident to quote our Bob Ross. But I am really happy with the surprise effect and the points of the squares are accented with an upside down sequence piece with a size six and a 12 bead at the top. And to me, they really stand out and complete that the square shape. I love how the most minute little pieces work together to create a big impact. I like this illusion of a square so much I decided to outline it and bring those corners to the outside edges. So I made a little stencil out of postcard material. Didn't really measure anything crazy here. I just eyed up the space and then just cut a shape that I had envisioned for the spot. Took a couple of clips, but ultimately I was happy with the design and now I'm ensured that each line will be relatively the same shape. Line the bottom of the stencil up to your seven bead stem and then place the point along your basted stitch line on the outside edge. The sequence bead cluster will line up with the point. So once you get it aligned, hold it down in place and take your chalk marker and trace along that edge. And go ahead and just like trace it a couple times. Get a nice firm edge there so that you have an, uh, an obvious stitch line to work against. Then you flip the stencil upside down and repeat for the other side. But save the stencil because we're going to use it in the next step again. Here I'm using two strands of DMC floss and I've exited out of the base of the line at the beaded stem. Working on the outside line of the chalk mark, work a running stitch. Now earlier I showed you how to make a running stitch along those beaded stem stitches by working the needle up and down through the fabric. And this is the same stitch, but instead we're going to work on the surface of the fabric. I interchange the method depending on what feels more comfortable with whatever it is I'm working on, but it's the same stitch. So in this case, you'll insert the needle into the previous stitch and then just along the surface exit one quarter inch away. And then when you pull it up, you'll see that the thread strand will be coming out in the center of those two points and you just go back down into the previous stitch and then a fourth of an inch away 
and then you'll see that 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 line is always in the center the thread is always in the center And this stitch is a little bit bigger, it's a quarter of an inch where a previous one was an eighth of an inch. But we have more ground to cover and we're also gonna be weaving another yarn in through these stitches, so we just needed a little bit more room. So I found another cotton sparkly yarn that I'm gonna to use to weave into the stitches we just did. The great thing about this method is you can introduce thicker yarns that would be a great addition to your piece, but that are too thick to stitch with. So I'm popping this up through the fabric at the base. If your yarn that you wanna use is too thick, you can make tiny stitches at the base just to hold it in place. This technique is super easy and fun to watch the effect. I'm weaving the yarn into every stitch from the inside out. You can definitely try it from the outside going in as well. Um, just choose whichever way you like better and then stay consistent. That's really the main thing. And when you get to the top, what I did was I went through the first stitch on the other side twice just to bridge any yarn gaps that could happen. I knew I wanted to add some blanket or buttonhole stitching somewhere on the piece. I love the antiquity that this stitch gives. So here I'm using two strands of DMC floss, come up just under and very close to the wrapped running stitch that you just did. Hold the yarn to the left and out of the way and make a perpendicular stitch an eighth of an inch away. Make sure the needle is over the thread and pull snug. So about a quarter of an inch away, repeat this step, but this time make the stitch a little bit longer, like around a quarter of an inch. Make sure that when you exit the needle, you are working underneath the twisted cord. You want this to be touching the cord so you don't see any little gaps. Um, also with each stitch, make sure it's perpendicular to the line. So in other words, just make sure that your needle forms uh, the letter T with the line that you're working against. See what I mean? Otherwise the, the blanket stitches will come out angled and it won't look as crisp. Working alternating lengths up to the corner, just watch your spacing and size to make sure that you're staying consistent all the way through. When you get to the corner, work a line right into the point. Catch the loop and then insert the needle straight down into the fabric to lock the line in place. Then come up in the V of that stitch and continue along. Don't stress too hard if you see a little space in the point. It's a really sharp point and you can place a focal bead in there like I did anyway. But I really like the way this stitch looks. You know, to my surprise, in this case, it also gives a shading effect inside that bright square line. So who knew? But that's the most fun about playing around and just building and designing as you go. All those little visual surprises that you get. And if you'd like, you can work a little stitch around the sequence as I did here. I have the sparkly yarn that I used for the weave, and I made a tiny stitch along the edge of the sequence. Bring the needle up halfway through the stitch and make another stitch about the same length running alongside of that sequence edge. When you come up again, you'll come out about halfway between that stitch and it'll be in the same hole that you ended the previous stitch with. This stitch is called the split stitch. 
It gives a really nice effect and is one of my faves. Well, what am I saying? They're all my faves. <laughs> this is so much fun. And then see if you can find four perfect focal beads to place in those corners and you just simply stitch them on. If they're large like mine, just make sure you go through the bead three or four times. For the outside points, you can use the same stencil you made to make a taller yet same shaped line. In this case, place the point into the corner and then rotate the stencil until it touches the line. Make your chalk mark and then flip it over and repeat it on the other side of the spiked flower. I'm using a size 8 pearl cotton, and this time I'm working a beaded running stitch. So it's worked in the exact same way, but you'll place a size 6 bead on the needle with every stitch. This running stitch is a bit larger than the previous one, and I ended up placing 9 beads on each side. Then I took a high textured mohair yarn and wove it above and around those beads, manipulating the strand so it lays nicely around the beads. And then finally, above the center petal on the spiky flowers, I wanted to bring in some copper, so I worked those tiny little fishbone stitched leaves to reference the larger ones in the center. I didn't draw it out or anything, I just eyed it up. You know, you just work your first one in whatever size, and then the next three, just watch your measurements from the other um, ones that you've done. Okay, well, I think I'm going to end that video here. I hope you've enjoyed this. I really loved making this, and I can't wait to make some more embroidered mandalas, and we may even do some more in this series. Um, next week, I want to show you the crocheted mandala that I worked, but 
But before I do that, I'll use the beginning of the video to show you how to finish off these two squares that we've done. So we'll stitch up in the front. I'll show you how to do the lining. I'll show you how to take this panel and cut the batting away and then just stitch it to one of your grid pieces. I know this video is probably getting close to an hour, so I'm gonna just leave it here and let you guys stitch this one out. Um, I have a lot going on, it's super exciting. I just purchased uh, nearly two acres down in Canyon City that I wanna turn into a wonderful stitching retreat. So definitely we'll have more on that. We close on Tuesday and then I'll know more about um, what this land can offer. I'm really excited about it. So see you next Sunday and I'll include a couple pictures from the property so you can see the big before, because it's a big before, it's a mess. <laughs> really excited to get it get started on cleaning it up. But, but anyway, thanks again so much for joining me. I can't wait to see what you guys do. Please post pictures on Mandala Unplugged. I'd love to share them in the future videos. As a matter of fact, I've got two freeform um, photos to share with you. Mary and Kim are following along. Thanks you guys so much for posting your beautiful freeform work. It's so fun to see these. Keep up the good work and keep posting photos. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.